Milton, seeking answers requires the testing of ideas, which involves disagreement. It involves debate. Sure does. How does one do that in a way that the disagreement doesn't turn into personal animosity? From what I've observed, you succeeded, uh, succeed in, in avoiding that outcome. I, I hope so. And, uh, not totally. No, not totally by any means, but uh, la very largely successful. <laughs> I don't know any f simple answer other than t tolerance. I think one of the great, greatest virtues in life is tolerance on, on every level. Um, I think when I'm asked, as I often am, uh, what's, what's necessary for a good marriage, I always say two things, love and tolerance. Mm -hmm. And the same way, I say, the thing is not to let disagreements become disagreeable, by uh, taking seriously the good faith and the good will of the person you're talking to and recognizing that reasonable men can have different opinion, but that if they are willing to talk together long enough and willing to, sit to, to uh, change their ideas, they will eventually come to a conclusion. And not challenge motives. Never challenge motive. Never challenge motive. Even though you may, you may feel that there's a motive there. Never challenge motive. Over the years, I've watched you calm down a debate by saying, uh, go slowly, go slowly, urging the participants to control their emotions and think carefully. Is that a personality trait? Is that something you were born with? Or, or, or did you train yourself to do that? Uh, to maintain civility and avoid ad hominem attacks? I, in a way, I'm inclined to say yes. I, uh, in the following sense, way back, when we were in Washington during the New Deal, I was at the uh, National Resources Committee. And uh, I, at one point, in a meeting with Faith Williams. Faith Williams, who was a woman at the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. We were cooperating on this project of a study of consumer purchases. At any rate, in one of these meetings, I lost my temper, and I accused her of ill faith or something. And I later discovered I was wholly wrong. And that had a very big impression <laughs> on me. And I decided I was never going to let that happen again. Ah, oh, you're exaggerating. No, I'm not. <laughs> Has he succeeded? Why do you say I'm exaggerating? Have I ever lost it's... my temper since then? Uh, no, I guess not. But uh, you're going a little far when you say that, you know, we're all friends. That's not quite no, true. No, no, I'm not saying that and that other people don't disagree and disagree heartily. Oh, a lot of people disagree, it. sure. Well, that isn't the impression you leave. No, I don't mean that. But I, I think, on the whole, few of those, not many of those who disagree, uh, are personally... <laughs> uh, we, they remain sort of personal friends. Right. Uh, not all of them, but most of them. Yes, but you yes. know, for a long time, there was almost everybody else disagreed with you. Yes. <laughs> so it's not quite true that, you know, we were all friends. Yes, we were all friends. <laughs> but. <laughs> but. But there. Uh, I really haven't been subjected to the kind of personal abuse that sometimes... No, we've, we've remained personal friends yeah. with most of them. And the others we just ignored and didn't have any contact with. One of the things I find frustrating is scholars, journalists, and politicians who take a position, often repeatedly, which proves to be blatantly wrong, yet they're not held accountable for their errors. 
Does the market a adequately police such kinds of shoddy scholarship? Now, that's a very good question. The place where it's most obvious has been, of course, in, in, uh, in Sovietology, where all of the people who talked about the virtues of communism and who were always saying, uh, you've got a great battle at hand, communism is sooner or later going to overtake capitalism, so on. They've all been proved wrong. And yet, I think very few, if any of them, have publicly admitted they've been proved wrong or have lost their posts as a result of being proved wrong. So I think there is a real defect in the market in that respect. Regarding accountability, has there been an area of research, uh, an idea that you developed that turned out to be uh, uh, wrong, a wrong turn, or it, did, it didn't work out exactly the way you, you thought? It, it uh, didn't stand up in the face of available evidence? He's always been right. No, no, I haven't. What about withholding? No, but that really <laughs> that, was not, not an idea. That wasn't his idea, really. No, no. I was just... I accuse him of it, but... I, <laughs> <laughs> I was just a clerk, at the, as, as, as it were, an employee at the Treasury Department, and they were going to have withholding of income tax if I had never been employed by the Treasury Department. So I really had no influence on the having withholding. I may have had some influence on the particular way it was structured, on the, detail of the details of the arrangement. But, and I, I admit that at the time, I did not recognize the harm that it was going to do in the long run. But in a time of war, and particularly in the World War II, the one thing everybody was focused on was doing something that was going to be important for the war. And we knew that for the war, it was desirable to raise as much in taxes to pay for the war as you could. Uh, the Treasury was hell-bent on doing better than they had done in the First World War. And you could never have raised, the, you could never have levied the taxes that were levied during World War II without withholding. It was absolutely essential for that purpose. And unfortunately, that's one case where once you got it installed, it's almost impossible to get rid of it. It's just too useful for the purposes of people in power. But I'm trying to get back to Bob's question, which is a very good question. And uh, I'm trying to think if I can. I'm sure I've backed off on details of developments, but I'm trying to think if there's any major line I took. I don't think so. I once, was, I once thought that, uh, that the Fourier analysis uh, was going to be a very useful device for economic analysis when I was at the, at the center here. And I later decided that was wrong, but That's that isn't the kind of thing you're talking about. The issue of, of economic freedom, Milton, the rule of law, uh, uh, your, uh, the modification, yes, the yeah. movement in your thinking in that regard. There was a big modification. Uh, f first of all, in capitalism and freedom, uh, I argue there are two things, political freedom and economic freedom. And I later decided that was a, not the right way to look at it, that, that you had to have three things, at least three things. Political freedom, civil freedom, and economic freedom. And the case I that really persuaded me of that was Hong Kong, under the British, where the people in Hong Kong had complete civil freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and so on. They had complete economic freedom, but they had zero political freedom. They were ruled from, from London. And so that was a case where I, I, I wrote recently in a new preface to an edition of Capitalism and Freedom, that in, th in looking back, the one big mistake in that book, I thought, and the one way I would change it if I were rewriting it now would be to introduce this trifectomy instead of the dichotomy. So you now conclude that rule of law is a very central concern as we try to expand freedom around the world. Well, just, just think of what we were talking about China. 
China is moving toward economic freedom very rapidly. Inevitably, that's being followed by more civil freedom. So far, it's not been followed by much political freedom. But I think in time it will be followed by more political freedom. And is it necessary? And, and, and in fact, it's, 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 a, it's a real puzzle whether the slower introduction of political freedom may not be necessary in order to allow the economic freedom to continue expanding.